Welcome to another episode of Leadership Espresso. Today with Henning Figge from Hayworth International Furniture is global leader in the market. Thank you for uh, joining us uh, today, Henning. It's, I am so thrilled, I'm happy and grateful. It's a privilege and it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you for the warm welcome. I'm I feel privileged to be on the show and uh, um, we are uh, one of three global leaders. Um, so just to make sure that um, <laughs> we try to, to participate in this uh, interesting market uh, with everything we have to offer. Fantastic. And let's jump right into it. I mentioned you are in charge of anywhere on this globe except for the US. So <laughs> you have a huge span of diversity on, on, and experience and facts and figures about different markets. And I think the, the real challenging question these days about workspaces and your companies and how can we leverage workspace? You know, it's not just about the chair and the desk, it's about how can we leverage workspace? Now with so many people staying at home, you know, during uh, pan the pandemic, what are your facts and figures about uh, what will the future look like? Uh, will we all stay at home like Google says or Facebook or Siemens now is telling everyone they can stay at home for good? <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's, it's interesting to, to see um, the different uh, tendencies in the world. And I wouldn't say that there's, there's one truth or one direction that is applicable for for um, every country or every com company, because as we are, as human beings are all very different. Of course, also the companies are uh, having their, their different cultures and therefore their different strategies and reactions to the COVID crisis. Apart from the fact, of course, that it started earlier in Asia and, and then went through Europe uh, to North America. So uh, we are also in different phases. What we see, is that um, the home office is playing definitely a bigger role in um, all countries that we are present. And so we have um, we're present in, in, in most of the countries in, in Europe and uh, Asia and uh, the Middle East. Um, our bigger uh, markets are China and India and Asia Pacific, uh, France and Germany, obviously, um, in uh, Europe, um, then also the others. But there's a different reaction um, when you have the freedom again to go back to work. Right. And, um, we, we, we observe that in um, countries like China, for example, there is a much, much higher desire uh, to um, go back to the office and work from the office um, than in countries like France or Germany. <laughs> and, um, is there a cultural difference? I, I would say so. So there's, there's, a, there's um, definitely in our company, there's also an age group uh, difference because our employees in Asia tend to be younger than, um, than in Europe. Um, but I would say it's culturally and it is also uh, driven by the, uh, by the age group um, that you're in. Culturally, um, people in Asia, they stick more together and they are team oriented. They are not very individualistic. The team always plays, plays a higher uh, importance than the individual and therefore also they are more easy to give up individual rights um, oh. if they be, it's in the interest of the, of the com community. And so they need this exchange and also in Asian cities, I mean, the, there's plenty of mega cities um, living is so dense and so the apartments um, are so small that um, you do not really find um, a quiet place to do concentrated work um, um, for your employer. Um, and so they um, tend to err more towards um, the office. Um, and then if you look at the age groups, there's um, two age groups that also rather want to be in the office than at home. Um, it's the, the youngest generation, the below 25 year old ones. Um, why is that so? So our research has uh, um, shown that um, they are of course very eager, the, the, the youngsters are eager to learn and for learning you need exchange, you need 
um, unplanned encounters um, also with your boss or with another functional uh, um, uh, appear um, and that cannot happen at home or it's at least more difficult um, um, to, to um, arrange for that. Um, and then you have the young families um, that tend to have also young children and um, <laughs> they also require quite a lot of attention and that also makes it more difficult to work at home. So we see that there um, was a big run after, after the lockdowns were over in um, China, back to the office. In India, it would have been the same, but it has been regulated. And we also try to uh, keep a certain distance in the office by always having two groups that are um, physically separated from each other. And only one of the two groups can go right. to the office in order to, to guarantee the, the necessary physical distance. But that's that's hard. I would say it's harder for for our uh, Indian employees than it would be on um, uh, um, or has been for our French. Yeah, uh, yeah. Employees. I can refer to that as I yeah. my, I have clients in India, and then they always tell me it's it's terrible. They have to stay home. You know, they, yes. it's by regulation, so they they really suffer that. So, which nations or countries would be the ones who kind of have a, a better mix of home office and going to work. So they don't, you know, they don't have to go to work, but they, they, they kind of balancing things out more. So classically, you see that um, I, I always, there's this wonder, wonderful um, cultural model of Hofstede, and then we are using um, the, the, what that is office culture, the cultural model of Cameron and Quinn. Um, the competing values framework and uh, Hofstede is always talking about female and male cultures. Female cultures are, for example, Scandinavian cultures, to a certain extent Germany and, uh, and the Netherlands, and they are more democratic and they are more egalitarian. And um, mm. in, in these um, cultures, the work is based on trust and not on control. Um, and they have been always more open uh, to work from home then the more hierarchical, more male cultures, um, which tend to be more prevalent um, in the south of Europe or also in um, most Asian countries. Yeah, so in, in the Netherlands or in Scandinavia, working from home isn't, isn't an issue at all. Mm -hmm. In Germany, if it is an issue, it's rather one uh, that is coming out of workplace regulations um, and maybe some more traditional um, companies um, also are not that open to it, but mostly you would find that already now to a higher extent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, regulation is hindering it a little bit, I would say, in Germany, uh, but I'm pretty sure that um, uh, um, our politicians are going to understand also that they need to make it easier in order to encourage work from, from home for where it makes sense. Right. Um, in, in, in Italy, uh, for example, I know from, from our own company, um, there is um, more a reservation towards um, encouraging working from home um, for cultural reasons. And um, mm -hmm. you can see that also in other um, uh, countries with, with a similar um, national culture, which is more male um, uh, and hierarchical. Um, as well. Interesting, interesting analysis. I haven't really thought of the German or Scandinavian uh, culture of being female. I had a different connotation, but but Hofstede <laughs> is right all the time. So <laughs> that's, that's not my model. It's the one of, of Hofstede, but I think he did a great work, and uh, and um, I like to use it a lot with, because it helps you also to understand why. I mean, we are developing furniture and, and mm. we do not necessarily want to sell it all over the world, but obviously um, the more money you invest into the development, the better it is if you can sell it in at least broad parts of the mm. world. And for that, of course, you also need to understand does a certain um, workplace concept or product um, make sense and would it be appreciated in the different markets that we are in there and for that we use a lot of these kind of models mm -hmm. in order to see what market potentials we also have for the products that we I, I fully agree now coming from your analysis and your summary uh, my takeaway right now is there's not much change in Asia in terms of 
uh, changing workspace. But there's more change potentially in the European, Northern European countries and the, potentially in the Anglo-Saxon countries. So maybe people can choose now, do I want to go to work in an office or do I want to choose to stay at home? Now, what is the implication on the workspace? On what is your vision or what is your, uh, what is your, um, uh, how do you see the German, the Northern European, the Anglo-Saxon workspace needs to change if I don't have to go to work anymore into the office? Yeah, if that is the case, and um, I would wish it would be already today the case, um, the, the office needs to become a destination where the, the employees come because they know that they can do their work or certain type of work, they are better than anywhere else. And that is, it, it should be anyway the, 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 the target of every employer. Right now in an economic recession, of course, everybody starts to forget that again, but uh, these times will come, come back again that, that um, uh, the people uh, don't have to be grateful to have a job, but, but, but can really define also for themselves in which environment do they want to work, which uh -huh. obviously is um, characterized by the people that you work with, but also by the physical environment that you can work in. And so the, the, the office should be or become, at least in the future, the destination to do certain types of work. While let's kind of exclude the, the youngsters and the young families um, uh, when they have their children at home. Um, otherwise, you would probably do concentrative work at, um, in your home or at any other third uh, place. Um, but when you want to interact, when you want to engage with colleagues or with customers, you would go um, to the office, which means that the, the share of workstations compared to collaborative work environments is going to decline. Uh -huh. um, and these collaborative work environments need to be quite versatile. Right now, they, they, they don't only need to be versatile, they also need to be planned in a way that you can still adhere to the social distancing rules that, um, of course, as long as there is no vaccine, um, uh, need to be applied also at work, which is an, an additional um, um, rate of complexity. But, uh, but overall, um, what is important is that you can flexibly um, react to the number of people that are collaborating. Um, and to the type of uh, collaboration that is happening there, because the training is different than if you do a town hall meeting, than if you do project work. And then the, the, the third dimension that needs to be taken into account is technology. Um, we all have experienced how seamless um, uh, in the meantime technology has become with uh, Teams, Zoom, um, uh, Bluescape, uh, Skype, whatever you call um, them all. Um, and um, obviously, uh, there will be also in the future maybe some people that do not uh, come for the project work into the office, either because they have a personal obligation or they are so remote um, that um, for sustainability reasons, they are not going to fly for every project meeting um, six hours uh -huh. to another location. And so the technology also will play a more important role. And, and being seen and seeing each other is very important. And so video conferencing technology needs to be seamless and should not be an extra system, but should be actually based on, on the systems that we are using um, in our day-to-day -day work as well. So- No, no, Henning, wouldn't that mean, now if you take headquarters like Siemens in Munich or BMW or uh, Mercedes in Stuttgart or any other place, wouldn't that mean you scale down office space by an amount X? Now in these times, mostly, you know, you want to reduce cost, but on the long term, you know, w w once we have the vaccine, let's, let's take it, you know, past the point after vaccine, you know, scale down and, and then you want to radically redesign workspace because 
the, the, the normal work, you know, doing your mails and, and, and analysis or whatever communication you can do from home, but the interacting, the creative togetherness, the social bonding, wouldn't we need entirely radically, you know, if you go to, to any headquarters, say, listen, 30% we can rent out to someone else, whoever wants to rent, <laughs> and the other 70% we have to reorganize entirely. Um, there's different there, there's different studies on that, um, and therefore I cannot really answer. Uh, uh, the big uh, multinational companies are going to reduce their their workplace by thirty percent. Um, I don't think so, because what the companies have been doing already in the last decades is condensing their their mm. um, workplace. They have, they have reduced it from whatever 20, more than 20 square meters per workstation to eight. And in some countries where the regulations are even a little more relaxed to six or four um, um, uh, square meters per person, um, including all the, the aisles um, and so forth and so on. And um, you will for, for uh, certainly there will be less less workstations for concentrative work because that can happen if you have the right technological infrastructure not only in the office but in the city where your employees live that can happen also at home but but you need space for collaboration and you cannot do that on a two square meter per person yeah. um, and so you need a room to move, move around and so i would rather say the space is going to be reinvested into the right um, work typologies um, from a concentrative um, uh, work or panel systems in the United States um, into a collaborative environments that are much more flexible. Um, and that is what I see um, definitely. Um, and maybe some of uh, the companies are also going to try to reduce and then um, the, the workstations even more. There's a couple of um, IT based companies that have even announced that their, their workforce is not coming back to the office until June next year. Um, I'm, I think it's going to be a, a, a big um, social cultural experiment that they're doing. <laughs> True. And, and I'm, I'm not sure it's going to be successful because um, as our research has shown, especially the, the, the younger age groups, they need this collaboration and this interaction and they are forbidden to do that. Um, and that is not good. Of course, there's also the responsibility in terms of health um, security um, and you do not want to be responsible for, for having caused an infection or even a death. Um, out of that infection, uh, but but in the end, as a company, you still need to be effective, and um, physical uh, interaction and collaboration will stay an elementary part of that. Yeah, so so it it will need to be this mix, mm -hmm. and you will need to uh, it, we, you will have to provide also um, a certain amount of workstations because if people come to the office. They might do the morning, um, the meeting, the collaborative meeting while they go there, but then of course they also have to do some heads down work and they need still an, a workstation for that. Um, and therefore it's, there's, first everybody was kind of worried that everybody is in the home office and you lose control over the people. Now they realize, oh, it's not that bad. Um, they're actually quite productive. Some of them are even more productive, some a little less. But overall, it works. Um, and now, all of a sudden, we go to the other extreme. We we vacate all the the offices. Um, the truth lies probably is always somewhere in the middle. And um, I'm skeptical about 30 percent um, uh, real estate reduction or something like that um, in the long term. Um, once we have tried out this new freedom that we all have realized we have. Absolutely. And I fully agree uh, on, on anything you said, uh, particularly on, uh, and my, that's my takeaway for today. And I'm very grateful for that insight that you shared, that the, the, the share of collaboration is probably gonna grow for different reasons. You said for the age groups, you know, for the young ones, as you know, my kids, you know, they used to be connected through their phone 
all the time with everybody on this planet. <laughs> so they want to keep the so social cohesion for the young families. You know, I heard when our kids are grown up, but for the young ones, you know, you can't work all the time, do homeschooling. So they want to escape. <laughs> and we are social creatures, you know, we can't compete against machines becoming machines. Our, you know, our advantage is that comes from social bonding. That's creativity. So it is. I am I'm so thrilled. I'm really grateful that you shared uh, your research and your vision. And, and as you said, this is a global social experiment that we're living through. And I'm happy to have an expert in this field. And maybe we talk in about six to nine months again and see where, how this experiment develop and then reassess what, it, uh, what, it, uh, what is the future of work in that regard. So Henning, thrilled, thank you so much. Grateful for having you on the show and take care. And as we say, you know, it's a leadership espresso. <laughs> Be inspired. Thank you very much. A little well. bit of water. Thank you. It has been a pleasure, and uh, it was um, a pleasure to to share my 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 um, thoughts about this. Even though I rather still call myself a student of the workplace and uh, not an expert of it, because um, this field is changing so much, especially in these days. Thanks a lot. Thank Cheers. you.